And now I'd like to introduce everybody to Dave Phillips. And let me just. So he's been working with Environment Canada Weather Service for 50, that's five zero years. And I thought I was doing good because I worked at the RCP for 37. His work activities relate to the study of climate of Canada and to promote awareness and understanding of meteorology. He has published several books, papers and reports, including a book on the climates of Canada and two bestsellers, The Day Niagara Falls Ran Dry and Blame It on the Weather. He was the originator and author of the Canadian Weather Trivia Calendar. He frequently appears on national radio and television as a commentator on weather and climate matters. He's been awarded the Comm Commemorative Medal for the 125th anniversary of the Confederation of Canada, the Queen Elizabeth Golden and Diamond Jubilee Medals, and has twice received the Public Service Merit Award. David is a recipient of three honorary doctorates from the University of Waterloo and Windsor and Nipissing University. In 2001, he was named to the Order of Canada. And one thing not included in the bio, he also gave a presentation to our seminar series a few years ago. So with that, um, I'll turn everything over to you, David. Okay, well, thank you, Mark. Now, do I share my screen? Uh, and um, does this do it? Yes. Okay. Um, so you only see one slide on the screen, is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Well, Mark, thank you so much for the kind words of introduction. And, uh, and, and I'm so grateful to Mark for guiding me through this Zoom uh, process operation. He, I thought his um, guidance material was some of the best I've ever seen. Very clear, even I could understand it. So I'm, I'm grateful for those, uh, uh, that information and, and, and also the words of, um, of introduction. Um, incidentally, the Meteorological Service of Canada this year is 150 years old. We've been issuing weather forecasts and severe weather warnings for, uh, for seven days a week, 365 days a year for, well, not quite seven days. Uh, in the beginning, there was no weather on Sundays, apparently. We didn't issue forecasts on Sunday. But for most of those years, uh, we've been going uh, full speed. And, and contrary to popular opinion, I was not a teenager back in the 1870s drawing weather maps uh, uh, for the weather service. Now, prior to the 1870s, though, um, people were their, their own forecasters. Uh, um, they, uh, in fact, uh, uh, would um, watch the daily occurrence of, uh, of the, the clouds and the, and the wind direction, and, uh, and their lives and livelihood depended on getting the weather uh, right and the timing and the intensity of storms. Uh, 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 farmers would... Um, um, would go out and before they would reap and sow, they would, they would sniff the air and wet their finger. And uh, mariners would look at, the, at the, the state of the ocean and, uh, and get a sense of what the weather over the next few hours is going to be because their, their lives depended on it. And then and hunters too would um, uh, sniff the air and they'd look at the, the texture of clouds and they'd look at the behavior of, of animals and plants to, to forecast the, uh, the weather. And early people, they thought that the weather was, um, in fact, they could, they could look at uh, various um, rhythms of nature. And that's how weather was controlled. They'd say, well, it's like the rising and setting of the sun. It's like the, the moon phases. It's like the, uh, the coming of the, the seasons, the hibernation of, of, of animals. And, uh, and they just thought weather behaved in a very similar kind of predictable kind of way, a little bit more complex than the others, but they felt by studying it and looking at it and observing it that they, they could get a sense of what the weather was going to be like. And reading the sky was uh, something that was uh, uh, passed on from one generation to, to the next. Uh, uh, much of it was remembered and, and communicated verbally or taught by taking the weather observation that you would try over several, several occurrences and then you'd put it to a, a kind of a, a rhyming couplet to, for ease of memory or, or, or education. And, um, and, and so they called it weather sayings or weather proverbs or weather wisdom or, or really weather lore. Now, in 
Today, though, I mean, I don't think people are as uh, uh, familiar as, as they're, they're almost oblivious to the, uh, to the atmosphere, uh, unless it's a, a brilliant sunset or a double rainbow or a, or a flash of lightning through the sky. They, they're almost as if it's like the visual music, you know, it's, a, it's like the frame, not the picture. It's, it, it's to be ignored, you say. Uh, we breathe it 16 times a minute. But we don't appreciate the fragility and the power and the and the majesty of the uh, of the atmosphere. Instead, if we want to know what the weather is like, we hey, we sit in front of the television or we turn a dial and uh, and we get the um, weather from the weather network or uh, weather radio or dial one eight hundred weather to get the weather or or ask somebody. And we just don't necessarily sense it ourselves and and try to guess what the weather is going to to be. And I think, regrettably, though, we take weather for granted. As I say, it's like visual music. We don't see the, the sky as uh, we see it as background. Uh, and uh, as a kid, I used to observe clouds. I used to love to watch clouds and, and, and lie down on the grass and look at, at shapes in the clouds and try to uh, uh, remember the names and the types of, uh, of clouds. Uh, I've seen clouds like look like this. These are what we call UFO clouds. They're um, um, uh, uh, alto cumulus lenticularis clouds. They often seen over British Columbia. People often see them as, as spaceships, you know, UFO sightings. In fact, we have more sightings of UFOs in British Columbia, twice as many in that province than any other part of, uh, of Canada. I used to think it was what they were smoking there, but in fact, it's these beautiful clouds, a result of, uh, of of air parcels passing over the over the various mountain ranges and and producing this just beautiful uh, uh, looking uh, cloud that you don't see in in other parts of, of the country. As a kid, I said, you know, I used to look at clouds and 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 uh, and look at shapes in clouds. Here's a cloud that we often see over Parliament Hill in uh, uh, in Ottawa. Uh, uh, it's almost a solely that cloud that occurs there. I've seen. Uh, uh, Elephants in, cl in clouds. Uh, I've seen the uh, Energizer uh, Easter uh, Bunny uh, uh, going on and on and on in, in clouds. I've seen uh, fingers or, or, or hands in clouds. And yes, I've even seen fingers in, uh, in, in clouds. Um, and and I, I contend that if we do careful observation and study of our surroundings, um, uh, the, 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 the color of the skies, the, the type of clouds, the texture of clouds, the direction of the winds, the humidity in the air, that by noting these, that we can do our own forecasting. I would never say you should leave home without getting the official weather forecast, but I believe that you can, in fact, uh, get a better sense of what's going to happen in the next few minutes by being more observant of our environment and our surroundings. As one forecaster once said, the best weather instrument ever developed was a pair of, of human eyes. Um, now, weather lore, and that's what I'm going to talk a lot about tonight, um, is, is a bit of a waning kind of a, of a topic. I mean, why would we need to learn about weather lore when, in fact, all we have to do is turn on the television or the radio and we can get it, you know, 24-7. Uh, 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 we can, by just pointing and clicking or tapping and swiping, we can get the weather uh, from different weather websites, uh, different apps, uh, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and whenever we want it. It's just there for, uh, for the picking. But and to be honest, most weather lore is rather superstitious and nonsense and contradictory and exaggeration and and, and all of those things. And, and a lot of meteorologists have a certain disdain for, for weather, especially the weather that forecasts the season ahead. Uh, they just think it is uh, ludicrous and, uh, um, and it, it, uh, it might have some merriment to it, some musings. I think it's really harmless. And so I don't think it's a, a problem, you know, noting weather lore and, and it can be fun. Uh, I, I think it originated, uh, uh, you know, many uh, decades, centuries ago from, from Europe, from uh, North Africa, from the Mediterranean area, our ancestors uh, and early uh, immigrants brought it over to Canada. 
And they just thought the climate was the same over here as it was in Europe, and of course it wasn't. And they didn't necessarily find the animals uh, that were uh, forecast or that, that they used to forecast the weather in Europe. So they would just take, if they couldn't find the hedgehog, well, they took the groundhog and it became the conscripted to be the weather prophet over, uh, over here. The problem with weather lore is that it's not based on, on science and actually rather limited observations. And, and most um, weather lore also connects with one element like the wind and, and weather lore or the, 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 the color of the sky and a, a piece of, of weather lore. Where most meteorologists know that you could make 12 different observations of the atmosphere at the top of the hour and you'd really need 12 from wind direction and speed from opacity to humidity, pressure change and, and uh, pressure rise and fall. All of those things can give you a sense of how the weather is going to behave over the next little while. But why do some weather lore, why, why do they work? Uh, you know, if they've not been based on science and limited observations, some have been around for centuries and have are reliable and, and useful guides. I, I even encourage weather lore for to teachers to teach when they're teaching weather, to introduce a little bit of, of weather lore. I think for one thing, it, it's kind of gives you the sense of the, of the scientific method, the, the observation, the, um, the, the postulating, the, uh, the, the testing and the concluding. All can, uh, I, I sometimes call it meteorological charades, weather lore. It's, it's, there's a strand of truth in some of it, and it's discovering what that strand of truth is can be fun uh, and educational and entertainment for, for kids. I also think it's helpful for kids to, um, uh, to understand weather lore, because this is how our ancestors forecasted the weather. And it sort of connects with, it helps people, uh, children connect with their great grandparents who, who, who believed in weather lore. And it was something that, you know, you learned at school and you, you wouldn't uh, leave home without uh, uh, getting it. Now, there's three points though about weather lore that I think we should understand. First of all, um, nature always forewarns you before it hits you. And that's the basis of forecasting. You don't get tornadoes with blue skies. And when lightning is about to hit you, your hair stands up, you have a blue aura about you and you have that tingling feeling. And then you're about to be hit by something that is 10,000 times the power of the electric chair. But it warns you before it gets you. And so, so I think that's an important element of it. We look at nature for signs that are happening and it tells us uh, uh, something about what's coming. I think also an important fact is this, another second key point is that the farther you look out in the future, the more uncertain the weather's going to be. I mean, that's so obvious. The one day forecast of temperature, today's temperature forecast is about 95% right. The seven day forecast is about 66% right. So clearly the farther you look out, the more uncertain things are going to be. And also this is an important point is that the behavior of birds and animals and plants or insects and fish, whatever, lower life forms are giving you a clue as to not what's coming, but what has happened, the current situation and past conditions. And that's the important thing. People think they're giving us a forecast. No, no, they're not. They're just reacting to current conditions. So there's several categories of weather lore that I want to talk about and give you kind of an agenda as what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I'm going to talk about short-term weather lore, the, the stuff that kind of is true, that, that works. Uh, the, the weather lore that tells you something about the next hour, two hours, maybe one day. Then I'll look at seasonal forecast, which is a bit ludicrous. It's only right by chance, but hey, it's been around and, and we'll take a look at what this is like and, and what it means. And then thirdly, there is a weather lore based on dates, anniversary dates, a certain thing happened on this date and then what's going to happen at a later date in the future. So that's kind of another category of weather lore. Then I'm gonna look at a fourth category, which is not predicting based on lore, but it's just making an observation and stating a fact, which I think is kind of fun and I think could be useful to outdoors people like yourself. And then my final talk, uh, uh, part tonight's talk, is, is directed to the hikers and paddlers and canoeists and campers 
is to say, okay, um, you know, if you leave home without getting a weather word, well, how can you observe our surroundings and, and the atmosphere and get a sense of what is happening, you say? So, and then also because I, I believe in weather safety and we, it's never something that can, needs to be repeated uh, uh, too, 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 many, too many times is a little bit about weather safety and the summer ahead as to kinds of things that you should remember. So, so let's begin with the, uh, the short-term weather lore. Hey, so, sorry to interrupt, Mark. A uh, quick question came in that might be pertinent to that previous slide. Uh, a 12 year old participant is wondering if that woman actually got struck by lightning. She did. She got struck by lightning um, a few minutes afterwards. And so certainly she didn't have a smile on her face when she was there. And it was probably a, a side flash. It wasn't a direct uh, because, you know, very few people survive a direct hit by lightning. And most, if it hits the ground and travels along or hits a tree and flashes over to you, uh, you can get a nasty charge, you can be killed, but, um, but most often people are injured from those things. Okay, so let's look at short term. Uh, as I say, this is the kind of weather lore that is the best chance of being successful. Okay, so let's look at some, um, some examples. When dew is on the grass, rain will never come to pass. Or when grass is dry at morning light, then look for rain before the night. Now, this could you could substitute the word dew for frost, because what is frost? It's just frozen dew. So when dew or frost is on the grass, rain will never come to pass. Now, this actually works. Works about, I would say, about um, two-thirds to three-quarters of the time. And the principle here is that dew doesn't fall, it forms. So it forms on picnic benches, on your windshield of car that's sitting in the driveway. And the idea is that if dew is forming on the grass, well, it tells you something about the cooling of the surface near that grass. It's cooled, and that coolness, the long wave radiation from that surface is being emitted to space, and there are no clouds to block it. So it's just lost to space. So the ground is cooling, and it cools below the saturation point it cools below that point where the water vapor turns into condensation to, to, to water droplets. Because the air, when it cools, can't hold as much water vapor, so it goes from vapor into the liquid uh, drops of water. On the other hand, when grass is dry at morning light, look for rain before the night, well, you don't get dew on the grass or your windshield. Well, what's likely to happen, it's cooling off, but it's blocked by clouds in the lower atmosphere, and this sends the, the radiation back down and keeps the air warm so it doesn't fall below the condensation level. So, so that's a good one. So if you see dew on the grass in the morning, good day for golfing on that particular occasion. Now, what about um, uh, uh, this, one, uh, this one here? Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Well, this has been around for a long time. You go back to the biblical. Uh, Matthew 16 has a reference to red sky at night, sailors delight. Now, I'm not sure what is the best weather to delight sailors, but let's say it's fair weather. And, and, um, and so what, what happens here and why there is this truth to this one and why it has stood the test of time for, for such a long period is that, um, that really, let's say in the late afternoon, early evening, you look to the west where the sun is setting, and you say that red orbit, the sun. Well, first of all, right away, it's telling you that you can see it, so there must be no intervening cloud between you and the sun, you say, setting. So that's a good sign. And because we live in the prevailing westerlies, the weather generally moves from west to east. So that good weather, there's no cloud there, is gonna be your weather tonight and tomorrow. So that's one sign. The fact that it's red tells you that the air is probably um, has some dust particles in it. It's high pressure area. It's sinking air. It's fair weather, high pressure. It's good weather. There's no inclement weather with that generally. And so because the, the light, light rays from the sun are being scattered by the, the dust particles, giving you that red spec spectrum. So, hey, it's, a good, uh, it's a, good, a good day. In the lower latitudes in the equator, you'd have to be the opposite because the weather generally moves from east to west. So in the morning, red sky in the morning, sailor take warning, you look to the east, that sun is rising. And of course, that's fair weather because you see the, 
the, the red sky to the east. And what follows good weather, fair weather, is foul weather. That's the general fair, foul, fair, foul type of thing. So there's a likelihood that foul weather is coming your way where you're standing. Also, the fact that there is some reddish tinge to the air is probably because there is water droplets in the intervening cloud. The cloud is thickening, it's lowering, and there's some scattering taking place. And so it gives you that kind of, of red hue as to the, uh, as to the morning uh, sky. Now, animals, early peoples believe that animals lived much closer to nature and they, that nature was kind to animals and they felt sorry for nature, felt sorry. So it kind of protected it. But we know animals generally have finer sensitivities to than human beings. They have greater instincts. They are generally react more quickly to change than, than human beings. And so what they're, again they're looking at, what they're sensing here is changes in the current situation or past, not in the, in the future. So let's look at a few sayings here and denote those that are true and those that are, are fiction. Well, here's one. When a, a cow tries to scratch its ear, it means a shower is very near. When it thumps its ribs with its tail, look out for thunder, lightning, and hail. Well, I don't know whether this is a, a true one or not. I know that some farmers feel that pigs, you'll often find pigs scratching against the posts before it rains. And the feeling is that the electrification of the air causes the little hairs on the pig's back to stand out, be itchy, and maybe it's getting comfort by scratching its post. Hey, this is supposed to be a, a sign of rain. Now, when I look around, uh, veterinarians, the farmers have said to me that cows, just before a rainstorm, what they want to do is they sense the rain and they want to lie down and get a, a, a dry piece of turf, sort of ownership of that territory. And so therefore they, they lie down, which is a sign of a rain. I find when I drive around Southern Ontario and I see half the cow is standing up and half sitting down, I, I wonder if, that's, if that means um, the scattered showers. But uh, anyways, now pets, pets have been, uh, people think they're like, they're like barometers. They think their cat or their dog is, can sense a weather change uh, much sooner than they can. And, uh, and one for cats are probably like almost barometers. And since they're as commonplace as barometers, if a cat washes her face over her ear, it is a sign the weather will be fine and clear. If a cat sits looking out the window, it means rain is coming. They don't always have that nice kind of rhyming couplet, but hey, it's a, it's a source of weather lore that has, stood the, has been around for, um, for centuries. Again, I think cats are, are unpredictable and they, have a mind of their, their own, I'm not sure they're necessarily reliable forecasters of the weather. Uh, dogs are said to dig holes prior to a rainstorm or will um, eat grass before rain. Now, I, I know I have had a dog once, Winston the weather dog, and, and he would eat grass and before, you know, sometimes before a rainstorm. And it was explained to me by a veterinarian is, is that the lower pressure in the atmosphere in the advance of the storm creates a buildup of carbon dioxide in their stomachs. They feel uncomfortable, they eat grass, are sick and feel better. Well, I'm not sure my dog would always do that, but I knew one thing, he could really tell the temperature, at least when it was too cold to go for a walk. You just open the door and he could sense anything below minus seven was too cold for him and he just wouldn't go, uh, uh, go out. So, um, um, so, you know, I mean, if uh, that, that some people feel their pets their, would not go against them are a good, a good sign of, <clears throat> of weather change. Uh, birds. Birds have been regarded as weather prophets. It's common uh, belief that sometimes birds in migration are not killed. They would travel huge distances and arrive safely. Um, well, the truth is this is that millions of birds every year are killed in migration by crashing hailstones, by, by wild winds, by, by lightning strikes, uh, um, and of course hurricanes will blow them off course, which is a birder's uh, uh, paradise. They see birds that have never seen in that area before because the hurricanes have blown them off, um, uh, off track. 
swallows fly high, clear blue sky, swallows fly low, rain we shall know. Now, again, um, swallows fly high in a high pressure area because of the density of the air is favorable for high flight. And in low flight with lower pressure, then they would tend to fly low. However, some have contended that swallows will fly wherever the prey is. The midgets are flying high under, under um, <clears throat> uh, strong uh, currents uh, at higher levels and, and prior to a rainstorm with overcast and, and winds, they will fly, uh, fly low. The beekeepers will contend that bees are never caught out in a rainstorm. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, here is a, a bit of uh, folklore that comes from Germany. If bees stay in the hive, rain will soon thrive. If they fly away, fine will be the day. I, my understanding is that bees will navigate by the, by the sun. And when there is a clear sunny day, they will travel great distances to get nectar and bring it back to the hive. But if it's an overcast day or a threatening kind of day, they will be close at home near the hive. And so, so that, that seems to be the case for sure. And incidentally, we know that cloudy overcast years are bad honey years. It could be related to the, 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 the condition of the flowers too, but, um, but, but maybe the bees too. Um, fish, um, anglers will tell you that the weather strongly is affected by the success of fishing. A uh, famous saying is, is, is this, uh, fish bite the least when the wind is in the east. When the wind blows from the west, fish bite uh, uh, the best. And, and so I, apparently it's when the winds are from the east, you have a storm system moving in, winds blow from the east, uh, fish don't like to bite, they, they head to the bottom of the creek or the, or the stream or the river and, um, and they're less active. But I find that angling is just rife with contradictions. I've heard it said that fish hide on sunny days or when it thunders, or good fishing occurs with rising pressure, or fish start biting when the barometer starts to fall. In other words, I think a sudden change in weather can give you either, can be a very good sign of fishing or a very bad sign of fishing. What I know is that fishermen are some of the best observers of weather. They can fine tune it. They can get the details are, are just leaving me speechless at times. So how they can write up and, and describe the atmosphere, but they don't have a clue as to the kind of weather that will give them uh, uh, their full quota within minutes or get nary a, a bite. Now, vegetation is also um, uh, considered to be a, a human barometer. Uh, tulips apparently close up prior to a rainstorm, or um, daisies shut their eyes before rain. Uh, these have been signs of, uh, we know that, that um, artichokes will change their shape, um, be more, have the scales would be more stiffly out and, or more, more pliable. Um, same with pine cones. Uh, pine cones uh, will react differently under both humid and dry conditions. And that's the point. It's not so much the change of weather, it's the moisture conditions of the atmosphere at this particular moment. And so with pine cones, for example, they will in dry air stand out stiffly and, and will open up and scales will be drier. But when it's damp weather, they will be more pliable, will close up looking more like a pine cone. It's sort of like that thing that I used to see as a kid, that little weather house where the where the man would come out with an umbrella on a, a day that was going to rain, and a, a woman would come out with a basket of flowers if it was going to be a dry day. And, and essentially that was driven by human hair inside that, that, that house, contracting and expanding the humidity. Uh, hair is a great, as uh, you know, you have a bad hair day and a, a good hair day. Well, it, it, it expands by up to 3% length of hair in der, under humid conditions. And, and can get very dry and fly away. So, so really that is really hitting you with sense of the humidity changes, and not really what the weather is coming. Now, one of my favorite of all little folklores is, 
When the ditch and pond offend the nose, then look for rain and stormy blows. And there is a strand of truth uh, to this, you said. Um, scientists, um, um, we, we, we think that what happens in a, in a high pressure area, fair weather, uh, uh, dry and, and warm weather, uh, warming type weather, that the air pressure is pushing down on the, the, the pond and the, the smells of the pond and the ditches. And so the smells are not available as readily as there would be under low pressure with, with rising currents of air and where the putrid smells of ditches and ponds, the decaying vegetation would be more, um, more evident. Now, some scientists have said that, you know, people say, well, I can smell it raining. Well, how could you smell rain coming when rain is, water is odorless, you say? And it could very well be what they're smelling is the, is the action of lightning charring the air, 30,000 degrees, and producing the pungent ozone and ammonia and nitrous oxide. And that's really the gases that we people are smelling that gives them a sense that rain is, uh, is coming. Some botanists believe that, um, that we, we smell associated with rain or is originating with volatile substances uh, given off by vegetation, the creosote in, in, uh, in desert vegetation, uh, turpins in a pine forest or um, various organic smells from, from meadows with higher humidity, higher temperatures, lower pressure, then the stomata of plants are open larger and more of the aromatic molecules and substances are being, uh, being emitted. It, it could be all in the, in the nose. We know that garbage uh, dumps, uh, manure piles and flowers uh, smell stronger when they are damp or, or moist. Um, and moisture in the warmth maybe helps our, our, our nasal passage so that we have a, a better sense of smell. Some of these aromatic molecules become hydrated in humid air, and so they have more of a chance of the mucous membranes in the nose would catch these uh, smells and therefore uh, improve the, the sense of smell of them. I mean, it could all be in the nose too, that after taking a shower and you smell the aftershave lotion or the perfume is always much stronger than it would be uh, prior to or in, in a dry uh, uh, bathroom air. Um, sounds in the weather. I think there are a few of these that I think are interesting. Sounds traveling far and wide, a stormy day will be tied. Or a favorite one of mine, when the for forest murmurs and the mountain roars, then close your windows and shut your doors, you say. And so it's been said that, that sound will actually travel far faster in warmer air than colder air. But we also know that sound travels four times faster underwater than it does in the air. And so that perhaps maybe just in advance of a storm, um, the air being more moist uh, will probably increase propagation of sound. We know that music halls tend to be kept cooler and, and moister rather than hotter and drier for sound propagation, the quality of the sound. We know that winds, I mean, try speaking into the wind or a favorable direction can, can make your conversations heard more easily uh, by, by a companion. We know snows are a great dampener of sounds. Uh, uh, we know those, those things called frost quakes that you can hear sometimes in a cold winter's night. Well, if there's lots of snow around, you don't hear them. They go on, but you don't hear them because of that muffling sound of the, of, the, of the snow. And then atmospheric profile, the temperature of the air, the colder the air, the more, and with an inversion above say Arctic air in the middle of a cold winter's day, that sound at the surface gets ducted, doesn't get diffused through the atmosphere, gets ducted along the surface and you can actually hear it. And uh, one of the great experiences I had was to talk to observers uh, who were in Snag Yukon back in 1947. And they observed the coldest moment in North America history. The air temperature was minus 83 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 63 degrees Celsius. And they said they could hear airplanes 10,000 feet above the station in Snag Yukon. And it, they felt it was like landing. It was like right next to them, it was so loud. They could hear conversations of, uh, of a, a town two or three kilometers away. I often say in cold weather, you don't gossip about anybody because they're sure to, uh, to hear you. Um, so 
let's look at some seasonal or annual weather lore. And I, I think this is really, I don't know of any that's, that's, that's truthful or useful at all. But for early pioneers, this, this, these were the most important aspects of weather lore. It was determining what the winter was going to be like, the timing of the winter, the intensity of winter. And because if you survived the winter, you lived another year. And, and, and they, they really depended upon signs of nature. Uh, they looked at chipmunks carrying their, their tails higher meant a, a cold winter, a rabbit's fur that was slicker, carrots that grew deeper, uh, cowern husks that were heavier, uh, wild horses had thicker coats. Uh, um, all of these things gave you a sense of what the winter ahead was going to be. I think they might have been more uh, pessimistic than optimists. Because for every weather lore that talked about a soft and open winter, there was four or five that talked about how tough and long the winter was going to be. Um, uh, here's what. A bad winter be tied if hair grows thick on a bear's hide. Well, you know, if he grows his hair in October and then you have a Lan El Nino, it's going to be a mild winter. It doesn't all, it doesn't all get a sense of what October or November is going to be gives you the character, the personality of the rest of the winter. I think it's based more on, on, on health, genetics, nutrition, uh, those kinds of things rather than the weather. But another aspect of this uh, folklore is uh, the season is, um, is the abundance of the fruit on trees or bushes. And whenever I go to, to Newfoundland, especially if it's just prior to winter, people will say to me, well, what, what's the winter going to be like? Incidentally, the dogberries on the tree of the bushes are much thicker this year, much more abundant, or, or there's a lack of them. So this must mean it's going to be a, a tough winter coming in. Well, apparently, legend has it that uh, if you had an abundance of berries on bushes, it was going to be a tough winter. Because you see, nature was looking out for lower life forms. And so we provided abundance of berries to give them something to eat. But how ludicrous it was that the animals who were eating these berries wouldn't eat them all because they knew it was going to be a tough winter. So they only eat half of them, you say. So they want to be sure there was some going for the next course, uh, which might be uh, weeks or months later. I mean, that is ludicrous. I mean, I think there is a very close association between weather and life cycle of vegetation, but it's all in the past. It tells you what the growing season was like what the germination, the budding, the blossoming, the flowering season was like. It says nothing about what the future is going to, to, uh, to be. So onion skin, very thin, mild winter coming in. Onion skins, thick and tough, coming winter, cold and rough. Nonsense, it doesn't tell you anything. The thickness of the skin, the number of circles or rings in the, in the onion, says nothing about what the future is going to be. When squirrels early start to hoard, winter will pierce you like a sword. Well, squirrels will gather as many nuts and acorns as they can find, and they'll forget where they, where they stash them, you say. It makes no sense at all as to what the, the winter ahead is going to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to be. Uh, even even the, apparently the spleen of a freshly butchered pig is supposed to tell you something about the weather. I met this guy in a talk I gave in Saskatchewan. I had to give the official forecast from Environment Canada, and he gave a forecast of the winter uh, with the by biting into the spleen of a of a freshly butchered pig. And and what he said to me was, he said, if there's a a bulge, a big bulge in the in the spleen at the beginning, and then it tapers off, it's going to be a soft and open winter. If it's fairly uh, no bulge at all, it's going to be a kind of a, a balanced winter. And if there is a large bulge somewhere and then it tapers off, it's going to be a, a, a tough winter. Fortunately, I didn't have to, to bite into his, um, uh, his freshly butchered pig spleen, but uh, I, I remember that, uh, that occasion. So let's look at some key date or anniversary weather lore. Um, and this one, again, is, is no sense of truth to it. Um, uh, and an example would be 90 days. I hear this on the prairies all the time, every time I go there. Now, is it true that 90 days after a day with fog, you're going to get rain? Not. Uh, it's just not predictable like that. Or thunder in February means there will be frost 90 days later. 
not. And um, a lot of the folklore based on key dates or anniversaries was based on or, fest or, or feast days. Uh, here's one, you know it, uh, Groundhog Day, February the 2nd. It was Candlemas Day, Saint's Day. If Candlemas um, be fair and bright, winter will have another flight. But if Candlemas Day brings cold and rain, winter is gone, it won't come again. They say that a shepherd in, in Germany would rather see a wolf than the sun in his stable on February the 2nd, because it meant that winter was, uh, was over and spring was around the corner. And of course, our European immigrants came to Canada and they uh, couldn't see the, uh, the hedgehog, so they conscripted the groundhog, who would be much prefer to be sleeping on, uh, hibernating still on February the 2nd, and they conscripted him to be part of that uh, weather lore that has been around for, uh, for, for more than a, a century. A lot of the weather lore based on anniversary or key dates is based on the notion of compensation or balance. You know, something happens in one part of the year will be balanced by something that happens in the other. March comes in like a lion, out like a lamb. I've tried it in Ottawa. It works about 30% of the time. That it'll be roar in and ba out. Well, that's not a very good score for a, a seasonal forecast. Um, or the type of weather during the first 12 days of January shows you what the weather will be during the corresponding months. Well, that might work in Jamaica or Barbados. It doesn't in the Ottawa Valley where you tell me July this, January the 6th will be like it's going to be in June of this year. I, I, I think it's uh, quick to see that it, it's, uh, there's an issue there. A white Christmas, green Easter. Green Christmas, white Easter. Um, so, um, or if a cow's droppings are frozen in September, uh, then they will be thawed out in October. And that, that comes from, from Finland. Now, there is a strand of truth to one, though, um, to one kind of, of uh, uh, folklore based on the anniversary dates, is a year of snow, crops will grow. Snow is a great insulator. And so it protects winter wheat and anything under there from, from the, the vagaries of, of the climate and, and the the, the cruelness of winter. Also, if you have good snow in, in, in winter, it provides a needed moisture for crops growing in June and July. So there, there's some truth to there. So let's look at some weather logic, not weather lore, not based on observa uh, proverbs or, or predictions, but just on, on truths or fiction, myths or, um, um, or, um, or, 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 you know, truths or fact or fiction. Okay, um, here, here are, are some, um, with a thunderstorm. Thunder curdles cream, lightning sours milk. Now this was true to some degree before refrigeration, when on a hot, humid day, the milk in that can would be, the lactic acid bacteria would be multiplying feverishly, and by the time that seven o'clock rose around when the thunderstorm came out, well, the milk was sour. So there was a sense that there was some truth to this. Um, never, never let a wet dog in your house or lightning will strike your home. Well, lightning can strike inside a home, but doesn't necessarily strike a wet dog. Now, wet dogs, wet horses are struck more than people because they're outdoors. They're, they're greater targets for lightning outdoors. So but um, lightning never strikes in the same place twice. I've had farmers who say to me, I built that silo over there, that barn, because lightning struck there, because they're assured, they're almost assured that lightning won't strike again. I'll say, well, you know, if lightning strikes there, there's something about that that maybe is attracting lightning. And I tell them about Roy Sullivan, a fellow a forest ranger in the United States that hit, was hit uh, uh, seven times by lightning. He survived. But people would usually, his friends would leave his side during a thunderstorm or restaurants wouldn't serve him. He was felt that he was like the human lightning rod. Uh, uh, so lightning does, does, does hit uh, twice. Now, some, uh, some truths, till April's dead change not a thread. I think that really works in the Ottawa Valley, particularly April. April's a month, a cruel month, they, they say. You have winter hanging on and summer wanting to get a foothold. So really until it's over, 
you can't expect the the snow to have totally gone. Hey, last year, Mother's Day was more like St. Patrick's Day. You had minus record cold temperatures in May. You had, I think, three centimeters of snow on May the 10th. So, hey, it, it sometimes it takes a while for, uh, for winter to, um, uh, uh, to leave. Um, uh, another couple, um, uh, one uh, is, uh, is it ever too cold to snow? It really isn't. Um, you get snow in the in the Arctic. It doesn't doesn't. You don't get a lot of snow. You get more snow, heavier snow, when it's closer to the freezing point, because air holds more moisture at warmer air. So very cold air doesn't hold a lot, but it still can give you a lot of days with snow, a lot of traces of snow, not a lot of amounts of snow. Um, rain before seven, clear before eleven. I love it. It works because you get that rain at seven is usually because of a late afternoon thunderstorm. And then it usually lasts three hours and it's over by 11 o'clock. Or here's one of my favorite ones. A sun shiny shower never lasts an hour. And it is a solitary cloud that rains, but it lasts for 30 minutes. So in an hour it's over with. So it's, you can see the sun and the rain at the same time it's one of those sunshiny showers. Um, catchy drawer and sticky door, coming rain will pour and pour. I, it makes sense. You get a drawer where the wood fibers absorb the humidity of the air, the moisture, they don't fit the fittings that well. And it's uh, they, or when chairs squeak, it's of rain they speak, you say. So, so again, that's what we're, we're seeing, uh, seeing there. Um, winds. Uh, following the winds, uh, uh, the winds of the daytime wrestle and fight longer and stronger than those of the of the night. Um, hey, that works because you see during the daytime the winds are stronger than at night at the surface. What happens is you get these convective currents at the surface. They take the winds at the surface and they bring up the air to higher levels. They couple with the higher winds at upper levels. There are downdrafts. And so the winds kind of from the up above come down to the surface and you get stronger winds. At nighttime, the sun is gone down. There you don't have these convective currents. And so you have more of a laminar flow. You have surface winds and higher upper winds. So you have less winds at, uh, at night. Now there are some Canadian folklore it's not as, I think, as romantic or as interesting as some of the other European weather lore, because a lot of Aboriginal ind Indigenous peoples in Canada spoke of, of stories and folk tales and ballads or fables. They didn't really speak of this, this kind of, of little sayings, you say. Uh, most of the uh, folklore that I've talked about today comes over from Europe, and it's just been adapted in Canada, often just taken, it's not even been adapted, it doesn't matter where the climate is different, it's just been force fed into to these kind of, uh, of surroundings. A lot of the Canadian literature is in conversation is punctuated with um, sayings, maybe uh, descriptions, not necessarily predictions. Um, a lot of hyperbole, a lot of exaggeration. Um, for example, I'll just give you a couple that, that just don't, don't ring with me because they don't rhyme. It's uh, not a fit day for a fence post, is a saying that you often hear in Prince Edward Island or in Nova Scotia. Uh, we're taken in the mailbox. It's coming up a bad cloud. Uh, or it's windy enough to blow the horns off a bull, you say. So Canadian weather lore is a lot of based on stories. Let me give you a couple of stories. In, in Alberta, one of the windiest provinces, have a lot of renewable energy there. Uh, from winds uh, more than any other province. Uh, they lead the way. Um, have you noticed the way Albertans stand on a slant? They grow that way to, counter, to counterbalance the force of the wind, but if it stops, they fall over. Or um, when you lose your hat in Alberta in a high windstorm, don't chase it. Wait a minute and somebody else's hat will come along and, and for you. Or in the Bay of Fundy. Um, sometimes out there in the Bay of Fundy, when the fog comes in thick, you can sit on the boat's rail and lean your back up against it. So that's pretty thick fog out there, but you gotta be careful because as soon as that fog lifts, you could fall overboard. Here are a couple of 
of folklore. When a horse yawns, it's a sign of soft weather, from Nova Scotia. And here's one in Ottawa. When we smell the pulp mill, it's going to rain. I'm going to refer to that a little later. Or another one, um, when you can't see Mount Baker, it's raining. If you can see it, it's a sign of rain. I mean, it tells you how, how often it rains in, in Vancouver during the, uh, during the wet season. Or here's one from the Lindsay Kawartha lakes that I picked up. Uh, thunder in any month with a letter R is not good. I mean, it doesn't really, not great for memory and passing on from one generation to the other. It really, what it says is, is rain in, or thunderstorm in, um, in June, July, August is, is common and good, it's no problem, but have it in no December, January, and February, and hey, it's an issue. Now, let's look at some, uh, move to the last couple of parts of my talk. It's about weather for hikers and paddlers and walkers and campers and, and, and how you can observe the surroundings, observe the environment, and get a sense of what the weather is going to be like. You say. So um, the, the one area that one kind of help in deciding what future weather is going to be is, is the moon. Now, the moon is powerful. It causes tides. It, provides brilliant illumination on, on wintry days, but it has no control of the weather. In fact, one of my favorite little sayings, the moon and the weather may change together, but a change in the moon does not change the weather. And hey, you could prove it. I mean, you get the same moon in Halifax, Ottawa, and Vancouver, but you have quite different rain, uh, quite different weather. Now, however, the moon's appearance, like the stars, can give you a hint of what the weather coming up is going to be. One is full moon frost soon. It kind of works, but only in the season where you could get frost. It doesn't work in July and August. But in, in, in September, October, or maybe April, May, early June, it might work in the Ottawa Valley because you're gonna, you might have a chance for, for, for frost. So full moon, right away, you're drawn to it. Hey, a full moon, right away is telling you there's no cloud between you and the moon. So the chance of the air of the surface is gonna cool off quite rapidly and fall quite a much, quite a lot. So there's a chance of, of, um, of a frost that night. Um, here's one, a ring around the sun or moon brings rain or snow upon you soon. Um, or very similar, when the stars begin to huddle, the earth soon becomes a puddle. Now, what happens here is that, um, is that there is kind of a cloud, very thin, we're gonna talk a little bit about this in a second, a thin, wispy, cirrus cloud, which comes in front of the moon or the sun, doesn't block it out, but it allows the sun's rays or the moon's light to come through and refracts it, bends it, so it can produce um, a halo, for example. Um, and that's usually a sign of rain or, or snow within 24, 36 hours. Or if you see a ring, that's the ring around the sun or moon, or if the stars begin to huddle, meaning that somehow that cloud is drawing your attention to the stars near the sun or the moon. And so you think there's more stars huddling there. And then that means uh, 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 a puddle. Now, winds are also a good sign of uh, wind direction, wind speed. Um, in our latitude, uh, out west, they often say, I only, I've heard business people say, I only do wet, uh, business when the winds are from the west. West winds, north winds are considered to be fair winds. East winds and southerly winds are considered to be foul winds. So when the wind is in the east, it's good for neither man nor beast. And in Ottawa, when you get an east wind, you get 30 to 33 percent to 30, 33 percent of the time, a third of the time that you get an occurrence of rain or snow with an east wind. But with a west wind, you only get 10 percent or 11 percent of the occurrence is with uh, occurs with precipitation. So the direction of the wind, and again, it's because low pressure areas, the winds are moving into the uh, into the, to the low. And so uh, low pressure moving south of Ottawa, you would have a favorable east winds 
flowing into that uh, system. Now, clouds also, I think clouds are really useful. And I talk to older people ask me, well, I'd like to learn a little bit more about weather. I say, okay, study clouds. Study, there's only nine types of clouds. Study the nature of clouds, how they form, um, what they're named are, uh, and you will become a real weather weenie. Uh, you can, you'll figure it out, you say. The higher the clouds, the better the weather. And typically what we see with higher clouds is moving with prevailing winds aloft that carry weather systems uh, and not generally associated with low, lower kind of precipitation with you see often with lower clouds and are influenced by local influences. Now, here's one, mackerel skies and mares tails make tall ships carry low sails or mackerel sky, mackerel sky, never long wet, never long dry. So, so let's look at mares tails. Here are some mares tail clouds. They're like um, cirrus clouds, high level clouds. Uh, they're delicate, curly clouds uh, composed of tiny free floating ice crystals. Even on the hot July 14th afternoon, you look up there and you see that high level cirrus cloud, it's full of ice crystals and the strong winds are smearing those ice crystals across the, the sky at that very high level, maybe eight kilometers above the surface of the, of the earth. And it can mean often, depending upon whether those little filaments or streamers, those feathers are pointing down or up, can give you kind of a sense of whether the rain, it's like contrails. You see a contrail and it disappears quickly, it's in very dry air, it means probably very favorable weather. If it's a contrail that is slow to disappear, it means the air is more humid up there, and therefore longer to disappear, it means the air is getting more humid, and that usually is a sign of, of some weather coming, coming in. So if the mare's tails clouds, if the wisps are pointing downwards, that typically means fair weather, that it's a good 36, 48 hours with fair weather, if the mare's tails clouds are pointing up, streamers pointing up, it usually means the, there's more air currents coming from the surface and it's the beginning of lowering and thickening clouds coming in from a, from a front. And so it will often mean rain within that period. Now, mackerel skies, uh, here are some mackerel clouds. They're beautiful clouds. They're, they look like ripples of sand on the beach and um, they don't know, denote change, but it could be good to bad or bad to good, depending on the kind of mackerel sky that you, that you have. Um, for example, a here's a mackerel sky that is called an alto cumulus mackerel sky, and it generally means fair weather. You're the weather, the foul weather is finished. You're, you're now uh, getting into a fair bit of weather, but in a zero cumulus uh, kind of cloud, um, this generally means wispier, patchy, and it often means the coming of a front, the lowering of the cloud, the, the, the thickening of the cloud, and it generally means uh, a little bit more, more, more cloud, you say more, more weather coming in. And so when clouds appear like rocks and towers, the surface refreshed by frequent showers. And here we have our are cumulonimbus clouds, the majesties, the kings of the sky that are dark and thick, vertically incredibly high, lots of action going in there, downbursts and updrafts and lightning and, and, I, and, and uh, uh, thunder, lightning, everything and hail and, and rain, everything and, and strong winds. These uh, denote uh, uh, some strong, severe weather. So. In, in summary of this section, I have one more section to cover. Um, so look for cloudy, unsettled weather. When the barometer falls steadily, that's a good sign. When the wind blows strongly in the early morning, it's supposed to blow more strongly in the afternoon, blow strongly in the morning, usually means a weather system's moving in. The temperature at night is higher than it usually would be, uh, could mean there's, there's maybe more cloud around. So therefore, this is a, a sign that wet, there may be for some inclement weather. The temperature is far above, is far warmer, higher than it would be for that time of year, is also 
a sign of um, some unsettled weather coming in. Um, of course, the darker clouds, uh, uh, that, that could be an issue, uh, weather, weather uh, uh, sort of uh, clue. Um, uh, high, thin, wispy clouds uh, increase in the amount, thicken and lower. Uh, hey, a ring around the sun or moon, a halo, all signs of, of a possible uh, rain or snow. And um, the sunrise that the sunrise that is red um, is 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 often can be a sign of, of rain. So let me this last section. What I want to do is to talk to you about. There's really no need for you to to pay attention to weather lore, even when you're out of doors, when you're paddling or camping, and you're out of sight of of um, of maybe television or or radio. Well, hey, you can you can get whether websites and apps and, and, and wireless public alerting programs are available to you. Um, and, and I want to mention a couple of these and also some, some weather uh, safety for, for pursuits that you enjoy um, during the uh, summer, summer season. Um, one that you might consider is, is our weather app. It's been around for a couple of years now called Weather Cam. And it's really, really good. I, I it's, it's this is my commercial for, uh, for this. Um, it, it gives you current and seven day forecasts out for 10,000 locations in Canada. It's an excellent radar, very uh, high resolution, zoomable map background. Uh, it has both English and French and easily switchable from one to the other. And, um, and, and, and this, this is a good app to give you what you need to make your, your life more comfortable and safer and, and more enjoyable if you're, you're outing. Um, we are also on Twitter. I don't know very much about Twitter, but here is some information about the weather office Twitter and, and uh, you can monitor various hashtags if that's your, your thing. Um, a good lightning one is lightningmaps.org. All you have to do is put in your postal code or your town or city, and here you can get up lightning flashes in the last 10 minutes that have occurred and gives you a sense of, of storminess in your, in your area. It's really a good one. Um, another one is Weather Underground, www.wunderground.com. It's a very good for radar, satellite imagery, and um, uh, crowdsourced information people who are also observing the weather and providing information in the area that you might be, you can certainly get the information from, from this one. Uh, another uh, app that is excellent is called windy.com. And this gives you for current and nine days out, wind conditions both at the surface and upper, upper level. So for if wind is something you're really keen on, this is a, this is a good one to, um, uh, to have. And so we can get um, um, <clears throat> uh, radar apps again are from various, um, uh, uh, we also have um, uh, wireless public alerting systems uh, that, that push out alerts onto your iPhone or your Android mobile device. And this thing really worked. Probably the real test of this was a tornado in Ottawa on June the 2nd, 2019. We had a vigorous cold front coming in, a thunderstorm over Orleans, a tornado developed near Orleans, crossed along the Ottawa River, jumped over to the uh, Gatineau side and was spotted near the Otto uh, Gatineau airport. And it was an F EF2 tornado, 130 to 170 kilometer per hour winds. There was also another tornado, a second tornado during that. It was not as popular as uh, populated as the as the tornadoes that occurred nine months before in Ottawa in September, that was really a rip roaring uh, uh, occasion. But on this one, June the 2nd, it was the one where our wireless public alert system was out and it did provide some helpful, useful, life-saving uh, information for, uh, for, for people on that occasion. Uh, we have weather radio, uh, we've been doing this one since 1976 and you, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, you know, weather cycling uh, broadcasts every 10, five to 10 minutes. Um, we also, um, let me just quickly go through, I don't want to, um, I wanna leave some time for questions. Let me talk a little bit about summer severe weather. 
uh, thunderstorms, tornadoes, and like um, a thunderstorm. You know what it is? It's just a shower of rain with uh, with thunder. We don't issue warnings for every thunderstorm. Only about five or ten percent of the thunderstorms will be given a severe weather uh, warning, and it's only when we feel that hail is going to be uh, two centimeters in diameter or larger. Uh, we feel rain is going to be uh, 50 millimeters for in a two hour period. Um, 50 millimeters or more in a two hour period is will prompt um, a severe thunderstorm warning or um, winds that will blow at 90 kilometers per hour with either a tornado embedded in that or a possibility of a tornado or a downburst wind. The downburst winds are much more common than tornadoes. Um, we get maybe 10, 12 times the number of downburst winds on Ontario, and they can cause as much damage as a, as a, a low-grade tornado, an EF1 or, or 2, or 0, 1, or 2, you say. Now, so let me say a word about tornadoes. The tornadoes are really just um, columns of just a cloud that comes from a cuneiform cloud and touches the ground. If it doesn't touch the ground, it's called a, a funnel cloud. They can la they are the most difficult thing to forecast. Um, the smallest weather feature on the world and yet the most destructive. And we are feel lucky if we get it 13 minutes in advance. So often the tornadoes hit before we issue the warning. Because you don't want to give out false warnings or else people will just ignore you. So it's, uh, but it's often in, in our severe thunderstorm warning in the summer, it's often implied in that. It's often we mention also, if we don't say there's a tornado warning, we say that tornadoes could possibly uh, come out of these kind of atmospheric uh, conditions. You have a duration of one, a minute, can last a minute or, or two hours. They can be anywhere from meters wide to two kilometers uh, wide. And not, you just can't get us the idea of the strength of the tornado by the look of the tornado. We have about uh, 62 tornadoes on average in Canada every year. We get about 12 per year in Ontario. Last year, we had 43 tornadoes recited in Ontario. There is a little tornado alley that goes from Windsor up to Lake Simcoe uh, and because of um, the lake breezes. Lake breezes from Lake Erie and Lake, on, lake Huron will be the trigger that sometimes will set off a thunderstorm and to, to develop uh, into um, uh, um, uh, a tornado. A water, uh, tornado over water is called a water spout, um, but even a tornado that is a tornado over land goes over the water is, is really a kind of a water spout, but often more damaging. Now some safety tips about, um, uh, about um, um, tornadoes. Um, the, uh, they, when, when a tornado, you see it, and again, it, it warns you. I mean, the, the sound of it is like the, the sound of a thousand Venetian blinds, or the sound of the roar of a, of a jet aircraft, a green sky, or the look of it. They're not always, um, they can be white or yellow or red. They go over a beet field, they can be a red tornado, but they tend to be dark and gray because they have a lot of debris, soil and dirt and building materials and, and what have you. Um, <clears throat> The safest place to be in a tornado is in a, in a well sturdied home, uh, one that has away from windows and doors and, and away from chimneys. Um, the more walls between you and the outside, the better you are. So an interior hallway, a base um, um, uh, a, a bathroom inside, a, um, a closed closet, something like that is, is good. Basements, lower, lower floors are good, but just don't go to the end of the stairway. The bottom of the stairway, go under a, 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 the workbench or a back of a Chesterfield, cover your head and your neck. Those are the most vulnerable areas. A lot of people are, are killed by flying debris, and uh, it's best to, call, to uh, avoid buildings with, um, 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 uh, with um, uh, large spanned roofs like churches and gymnasiums and, and, and uh, shopping centers. Uh, uh, cafeterias, these automobiles, you know, it's kind of controversial, you know, with cars now, the way they have padded seats and airbags, they may be protected. What we realize, though, is that you can't outdrive a tornado. You come, sometimes can't see 
if it's coming or going. So it, it's, and, and debris can block, uh, block roads. They can also have traffic jams. I've seen in the United States where dozens of people have been killed and are waiting for, for the, the traffic to clear, you say. And so outdoors, um, you kind of want to um, avoid um, um, uh, trees, of course, tall trees. Um, it's best to get out of your car, go into a ditch or um, a ravine, uh, some kind of low-lying area. You don't want it to be flooded if some accompanying rains. Uh, but if you're out in a boat, get, get to shore, um, seek shelter in the harbor and and, um, and, and really at the first sign of a thunderstorm. You shouldn't wait till the end to see the thunderstorm. Any kind of weather warning would cause you to, to, save, uh, uh, to go to safety. Mobile homes are not safe. If your mobile home is, uh, you know, especially if it's uh, uh, orientated uh, a broadside to the tornado, it's not good. They, they roll. Over half the people killed in the United States live in in trailer parks or in um, recreational vehicles um, and because uh, they're just not sturdy enough. So let me close with a comment about lightning. Um, lightning is um, deadly. Uh, it's the most, it's the deadliest uh, weather element in summertime in Canada. We get an average of 10 or 12 people are killed in Canada every year by lightning and 10 times that number, 11, 12 times that number are injured by lightning, uh, but require hospitalization. Um, lightning strikes Canada maybe 3 million times a year. Um, every three seconds in the summertime, lightning strikes somewhere in, in Canada. Um, it is uh, lasts only a fraction, but it is powerful. And lightning is, everybody's afraid of thunder, but not lightning. It's, it's thunder is the bark, lightning is the, is the bite, really. In Ottawa, you get on average about 23 days a year with a thunderstorm. You could have several hours during that day, but 23 separate days with thunderstorms. And about 8,000, if you took a, a 100 uh, diameter, 100 kilometer diameter out of Ottawa and around through a circumference, uh, would be hit about 8,000 times a year from cloud to ground uh, lightning. Uh, some of the um, lightning, um, uh, safety tips, um, of course, um, only 1% of lightning occurs inside a home. Um, when you're near plumbing or uh, talking on a landline, uh, those kinds of things, you want to avoid those. Um, water is a good conductor of electricity. So you want to avoid um, anything dealing with water. Uh, never be out in a boat in a cabin. Uh, you want to be in a a boat with a cabin, okay, but but not in canoes or sidus or rafts or or things like that. On land, um, you want to be a car and a truck are safe places. So this is often the, the controversy that we have or contradiction. You tell them tornadoes with lightning, it's not safe, but lightning alone is safe, uh, uh, especially if it's, well, it's not a convertible or a back of a pickup truck. It's inside the car. It's not the rubber tires that protect you. It's the Faraday cage that takes the lightning strike and puts it into the tires and into the ground, um, as long as you're not touching anything uh, metal. If you're outdoors, uh, best to be in a, or in a campsite situation. You don't want to be, you wanna get into a bat catcher's position or a leapfrog position. Um, kind of a, a controversy in sorts. You wanna avoid trees, yet forests are probably a safe place. I only, I only whisper that because it's the tree that is on the golf course that becomes the, um, the most difficult thing. It's that solitary tree that's the highest uh, object. And so lightning will seek an easy way into the ground and will go to that tallest object. But in a forest with a multitude of trees, as long as you're not under the tallest tree, you know, you're probably in a, in a safe kind of um, environment.